All right, let's go ahead and start. We're going to, um, we're, we're in interesting territory tonight because normally, as you guys, uh, most, or many of you know, what we do on Wednesday evening is um, designed to supplement what we do on Sunday morning. So we, we have whatever series we're in, and then usually on Wednesdays, we're unpacking it. Uh, at a different level, adding some more stuff to it. So by the time you're done, you have a nice package of information, material that you can grow from, work with, or it gives you an opportunity to stretch some things out. Well, because of the scheduling this time, with the children's musicals and the way that we have midweek set up, this becomes like a prologue to what we start on Sunday. This Sunday, we start a series called 1090 Legacy Lane. Um, that number means something. I'm not going to tell you what it is tonight, but it means something. Um, I will tell you this, though, that there is a huge difference between what is legendary and what leaves a legacy. And you're called to do one or the other. And we're going to be unpacking that over these next few weeks together. But the foundation for all of that happens with what we're talking about tonight in the next couple of weeks. Now you say, okay, so... I still don't know what we're talking about. Well, mm -hmm. we, I know that. And it will, it will become so much clearer to you um, once Sunday comes. But tonight, we start a series called Three Little Words. Now, I've used some words up here. These are phrases that are um, that you've probably heard it somewhere in your life. Go for it. If you're a Rocky fan, that was always a, uh, one, of the, one of the posters always had that. Creativity takes courage. Dreams come true. Fight for truth. Be the change. Never too late. I love you. Please forgive me. Those go together, by the way, um, <laughs> in many circles. Uh, if you're a Beatles fan, let it be. Do it now. If you're a parent, yeah. <laughs> you've said that many, many times. Um, count your blessings. Uh, love your enemies. Three little words. Uh, words that we are uh, used to hearing. Um, there's a whole lot you can pack into three little words in a sentence. No doubt about it. And if you think about it, I mean, sometimes those short sentences, those three little words can be loaded uh, with all sorts of meaning and they can... And can change your life if you know if you let them. And so we're going to spend some time talking about three little words that will change your life. Um, and it is basic. That it is, it is the most basic foundational stuff that we can talk about. And it's just simple, three simple words. God is love. God is love. Those three words change everything. And if I were to ask you um, to think about those three words, we would come up with this idea that, okay, those are three little words, but they're mighty in meaning. Um, and those three words ring throughout the galaxy, and they change everything. They change everything about your life, everything about my life, everything about what we're going to be, what we're going to do, what we're going to become. Um, but don't think for a minute that those three little words, God is love, are simple words. They're not. They're anything but simple. These phrases, they're fairly simple. They're catchphrases. God is love is not. That means something far different. And so if I were to ask you, show of hands, how many of you believe that God is love? See those hands. Okay. This question is not as easy. How do you know it? What is that now? He suffered and died on a cross for you? Okay. So he proved it. He's proven it. Then he rose again. He rose again. The Bible says. The Bible says, sure. You've experienced it? Experienced it? Okay. Anybody else got any? I mean, you're not going to be wrong. I don't think you're going to be wrong. Let me put this I don't think you're going to be wrong on this one. He created us. He created us. He created the world for us. Yeah. What does he have to do that? Yeah. Put us in it. I mean, those words really are foundational for everything else that we do. Those three words get us here tonight, right? Because if God's not love, we don't show up. Right? If God's not love, we probably don't know each other for the most part. Um, God is love changes most of our relationships. God is love changes, hopefully, the way we make decisions. Uh, the fact that God is love changes the way that we approach each day of our life. 
the simple task and the complicated task? Those three words are not simple words. Those three words have embedded within them, within them the power to change everything. They have the power to make sure that, you know, when it's all said and done, that we leave a legacy behind. We're going to kind of talk about that in the days ahead. Um, years ago, uh, you've heard of the preacher uh, Dwight L. Moody, maybe. Some of you may have. have. Um, but when he was preaching in Chicago, there was a poor drunkard that stumbled up the steps of the front door of his church. And as the story goes, he pushed open the door, um, and he, he didn't see anybody inside, uh, even though the place was very full. His eyes instead were drawn to what was above the pulpit. There was a sign above the pulpit where Moody preached, and it simply said, God is love. And it struck him in that moment that that phrase, if it were true, meant something. And to him, it made him angry. It made him angry because his life stunk. <laughs> And it made him angry because he felt like God had been unfair to him. And it made him angry because he just believed that if God was really loved, that his life wouldn't be the pit that it was. And so he staggered down the steps, uh, muttering to himself on the way out, God is not love because if God would love, if God was love, he would love me. And he doesn't love someone as miserable as I am. It's not true. Uh, he went on his way, but the more he thought about it, those words were just kind of burning inside of him. God is love, God is love, God is love. And he couldn't resist to ask the question, is that really possible? And so he turned around on the street, he went back into the church, confused this time, a bit desperate, and he sat in the very back row, in the very back corner, and wept. He just wept as Dwight Moody preached. When church was over, people got up and they left. They filtered out the door like they do in every good church. Dwight Moody greeted people at the door on the way out, shook hands, they talked, and things like that. But then this guy was still inside, and he was still in there, and he was just weeping and um, crying. And so Moody walked over to him and said, you know, um, he uh, wanted, to shake his, wanted to shake his hand, and he... he uh, sat down with him, he said, you know, he said, what, what are you crying about? He said, what did my sermon touched you so much? And the man said, oh, Dr. Moody, I didn't hear a word that you spoke tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes when you're a preacher, right? He said, what it is, is those words above the pulpit, God is love. He said, that broke my heart. I couldn't hear a word that you said because I just kept thinking about that. I just kept thinking about that. Is that possible? Is it true? Is it real? And so Dwight Moody sat with him for nearly an hour, explaining to him all the ways that God loved him and why that is real. See, we don't think about it this way, but you have banked your eternity on the fact that God is love. And if not, you're a bunch of suckers. I mean, you know, you're banking your eternity that God is love. Um, if you're wrong and the culture is right, then you're, you're kind of foolish. I'm kind of foolish. So when I say that those words are big, they are huge. They are huge. There's no middle ground on that. He either is or he isn't. And if God is love, then that changes everything. Um, and a lot of people have struggled. They struggle with that. I mean, I... I, I you know, I mean, and I, gosh, I understand I'm a preacher, so I understand that I do have conversations with people that maybe other people don't always have. But you know what? I talk to people on a regular basis that think that God can't love them or God doesn't love them as much as the church says or that I might tell them or because they've done things. They, 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 they've done things in their past. There's stuff that they know is just junk. Um, stuff that they can't clean up, um, stuff that they think is so big um, that God's kind of turned his back on them. Maybe their life has kind of fallen apart. Maybe their life isn't going the way they want it to. Uh, and because their understanding of God is so limited, they don't really believe that um, God loves them as much as someone else. And so 
as a result, they struggle with that. They can't push, they can't come reconcile the way that things happen in their world and the world around them. Um, and so I want you to know that, um, as Max Lucado said in one of his books one time, it's a great phrase, that you cannot fall beyond his love. That's a great phrase. What that means is there's nothing you can do that's so bad you're going to fall beyond God's ability to love you. That's a huge phrase. Lucado comes up with phrases every once in a while that just stick. Um, now, God's love includes people that you have trouble loving, by the way. That person that drives you nuts. God loves them just as much as he loves you. That idiot that cut you off on the way to church tonight in traffic. That you called, whatever name came to your head and heart. God loves that idiot. We'll go with that one. Just as much as he loves you. Just as much. Um, that entire nation of people across the ocean. The Ninevites, the low down, no good, dirty rotten, egg sucking Ninevites, whatever they were. God loves them just as much as He loves you. When you take an inventory of the human race and humanity around the world, um, God loves them just as much. Um, and God loves you. And that, by the way, if you're not sure about that, or if you take notes, you ought to write that down because that three-word sentence is the most important <coughs> factor of your life. God is love. If he's not, nothing else matters. If he, if he doesn't, then nothing else we're ever going to do matters. That three-word sentence changes everything. Um, it should define every goal that you have. It should define every action that you take. It should, should, should define every moment of your existence, uh, every conversation. Um, and understand that he doesn't just like you when you do well. He, 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 he loves you even when you screw it up. Um, even when you fail and fall. God still loves you. And as a body of followers who are trying to be like Christ, we have to learn how to love. And we have to learn to love, but we have to learn to love and communicate it with truth and not be afraid because sometimes in our culture we think if we speak the truth, it's not going to be very lovely. But we have to speak the truth. And you do that sometimes in love. The problem we have with that sometimes, we don't, we don't love very well. We don't know how to love very well. That's our problem. God is love. And if you let it change you, it changes everything. And so let's go to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John 4, verse 8. And let's take a look as we begin okay, um, at the declaration of God's love, because the Bible tells us that God is love. Um, somebody read 1 John 4, verse 8. One who does not love God, or excuse me, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Okay. And okay, while you're there, drop down to verse 16, because John reiterates the truth just a few verses later in verse 16. We have come to know and we have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Yeah. God is love. So important, he comes back and says it just a few verses later. God is love. And it's important, if you're going to understand that, uh, and I think sometimes our struggle is we don't, we don't really grasp it. It's, such a, it's, it's so big. Um, but there are two mistakes that we make when considering that statement, God is love. The first is to invert the equation and insist that love is God. That is a serious, almost catastrophic mistake. Because there are so many false loves that bear little or no resemblance to the perfect love of God. I love Bluebell. <laughs> that doesn't compare to what it means when God is love. 
I, I love a lot of things. And we live in a world that uses that word all the time. You walk out the door, ask somebody what they love, they'll give you, they'll give you a list. None of that stacks up to the importance of those three words, God is love. How do we know it? Because of what God did. And yet we live in a culture that would love, love nothing more than to take those three words and water them down to no meaning. Let me give you an example of it that may hack somebody off that hears this or may hack some of you off in the room, and that's okay. I want to use three words, three words, three powerful words that are really big in the culture and really hot right now. Ready? He gets us. You see the commercial on Super Bowl? Three times. <laughs> the pie line, you know, Jesus doesn't hate, he washes feet. He gets us. And all those people that went doggedly because they were so inspired by the artwork to the website, JesusGetsUs.com, HeGetsUs.com. You know there's nothing on that website that tells you how to be saved? Is I invite you into a conversation with the Jesus who loves you. But they'll tell you what you're going to talk about. And yet we have preachers, national preachers all across America who have jumped into that because they missed the main point. See, Jesus saves us. He saves us because he loves us. The fact that he gets us is a given. He saved us. The reason he saved us is because he gets us. If you do a deep dive into the He Gets Us website, you define that we are now kind of leaning into that DEI culture that we live in. And there's a whole lot of people that have got some accountability issues to come up with the fact that they haven't, there's nothing there that gets them to the relationship with God. And there's some people that really love it. They think it's the greatest thing in the world. I can't tell you how many times since the Super Bowl that question has come either via text or email to me. What do you think about that? There's big controversy on that right now. And I can't tell you how many people have sent me videos of the commercials that they should have made. <laughs> where it shows people who give, there's moments where they have been in those positions where God has pulled them out of the gutter, pulled them out of a lifestyle, pulled them back from the brink, pulled them back. He saves us. Getting me was never the issue. He saves us. I'm reminded again of what Jesus said on the cross about those who are following for you and they don't know what they're doing. And I think that sometimes in the Christian world, we don't know what we're doing. Because we have somehow lost the ability to communicate that the love of God is about Him redeeming you and saving you from a life that you are choosing to live yourself, not on your terms, on His terms. And we're so busy trying to set the terms of how God's love has to be that this is what it looks like. And I want you to know, it makes for pretty pictures and great commercials. It ain't biblical. And if you invert it, and you confuse the phrase that love is God, you missed it. God is love. God is the defining standard of love. And everything else below that, any way, anybody that loves and tries to model love, they're all, always trying to model the love of God. They're just doing it in imperfect ways. Because he is the standard bearer for love. God is how we've learned to love to begin with. So when we say God is love, we are talking about an attribute of God that the culture, whether they know him or not, is trying to emulate and somehow trying to communicate. And sometimes we do it wrong and very ineffective, but wonder why that it never works for people. We wonder why that it just doesn't have the punch that it used to have. Why do we lose the culture? Because we've said everything is okay. Why? Because he gets us. I got news for you. When he got me, he had to save me. Because you enter a conversation with Jesus. And see, and I'm, I'm saying this from a guy who doesn't give invitations on Sunday morning. <laughs> so if this hits my radar, this has got to be big, okay? Because I'm like the anti-church guy. I mean, I've been taking heat for years because we never give an invitation. We never give an invitation. We never give an invitation. You don't love Jesus enough, don't give an invitation. You know, and I just kind of talk through it. We invite people to conversation all the time. But I can promise you, when we invite them into conversation, the conversation always ends up in the same place. You've got to accept Jesus. Because, see, it's not about you inviting me inviting someone into a conversation with me, because who gives a rip what I have to say? I can't save anybody. 
So when I'm telling you this is what's going on in our culture right now, this is a fight in the Christian community right now, I'm telling you it's a big deal because I'm like the anti-invitation guy. I'm all about entering the conversation. You just got to go somewhere with the conversation, though. Why? Because I talk to a lot of stupid people. <laughs> and so it ain't not, he gets us. Yeah, he gets us. But it ain't going to get you into heaven. He saves us. So don't flip-flop the fact and take God as love and turn it to love as God. That doesn't work in our culture. That doesn't mean anything to anybody. You, can, you could probably meet 10 people and say, do you think God loves you? Yeah, I, I, God loves me. But that doesn't mean I know God. That doesn't mean that love has changed your life. And see, that's a huge mistake that we make when we try to water down that attribute of God. It's the first mistake. Second mistake is we can't make the mistake of subordinating all of God's attributes to his love. See, this is where Jesus gets us, or he gets us in trouble, gets us in trouble. Because he's more than just love. He also is just. And, it, and, his, and his justness is no less than his love. This is one of, his love is one of the many attributes of God, and he's chosen to reveal himself in love because we can understand that in a way. But that doesn't mean that that love is greater than any of the other attributes of God because God is God and all the attributes yeah. Are holy. They are perfect. He is God. And we want to make the love of God greater than some of the other things that God does. And you just can't do that. One, it's bad theology. But we don't care about theology. I know that. But bad theology reflects in a lack of understanding about the bigness and the majesty of God. Um, see, God is all-knowing. And he's just as all-knowing as he is love. That's why he gets us, by the way. <laughs> um, but he is all-knowing. Um, he is infinite. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is eternal. He is the creator. He is wonderful. He's counselor. He's prince of peace. And all of those are attributes of God, and they all fit together. And they all mean something when you fit them together. Just start plucking them out and trying to make one greater than the other gets you in serious trouble, and it waters down your ability to know God. See, if I say, well, I can just go ahead and do this because, well, God loves me. Well, yeah, but God said, don't do that. Well, I don't have to be obedient here because God loves me. No, he loves you, and he's going to forgive you. Thank goodness. His grace is going to cover your sin. But that grace came at a price, and God is just. Well, I don't have, I'm not going to say this to them because, well, they would not like me, and I might offend them. But what if you're the person that God put in their world to say something to them? Your lack of obedience now has meant that you think God's love is more important than you being obedient. See, and, and, and we, are, we are really good as followers of slicing uh, real thin what we want to do and what we don't want to do. And as a result of it, we've lost the impact and the meaning of the fact that God really is love. See, God is telling us something about his nature and his essence. Uh, it's not merely that God loves us. The phrase means what it says. God is love. So everything that he does is rooted and motivated by love. He made the world because he is love. He formed human beings because he is love. He rules the universe in love. He has given you an opportunity to be saved in love. He wants you to enter a conversation because he loves you. And you will go to hell if you don't accept him because he loves you. 
That's God being love. And we somehow in our, in our existence have forgotten that. Um, and so John, in those verses we read, is reminding us that in the world that he created, we should never forget about his love. Um, Bartlett's familiar quotations list approximately 1,300 different definitions, reflections, and opinions on the subject of love. <laughs> From the sappy to the perverse. Uh, everyone talks about love. Everyone talks about it in one form or the other. Um, everyone's driven by the need to give it or receive it. Um, false ideas of love tear the world apart. False concepts of love rip apart hearts and nations. Um, and here's why. I'm going I'm to tell you why. I'm going to give you the definitive all-time forever answer as to why. Because the more important a thing is, the more counterfeits there are. For example, there are no counterfeit paper clips. <laughs> Who gives a riff about a paper clip? But there are plenty of counterfeit religions. There are pretty there are plenty of counterfeit veins of groups that try to call themselves Christian and aren't Christian. Because the more important something is, the more counterfeits they will be. And so when we say the phrase that God is love, we enter a conversation with people, if you want to keep it in there, um, that people have heard and seen so many examples and so many bad examples of love that they're skeptical of God. Go back to the guy on the street when Moody's preaching. God can't love him. If God loved him, his life wouldn't be a mess. I mean, how many times have you had a moment where you just thought, God, what are you doing? Only to have me say a few weeks ago, then the world's not fair. I mean, <laughs> it's never going to be fair. It's not that being fair. Um, and it's not. But it doesn't mean that God's not love. He is. And for us to understand that God is love and to be able to embrace that, um, that means that we have to become experts in that topic. And all the reasons that you know that God loves you, and you shared them all, and there's no wrong answers. Um, but just like we can't look at pop culture as an authority of what love is, because, I mean, come on. How many times have we laughed about song titles? Yeah. I mean, and, and if it wasn't for love, there would be no songs, right? I got to know what love is. I want you to show me. <laughs> Pat Benatar says love is a battlefield. <laughs> Love yeah. yeah, love stings. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, the great philosophical question: What about love? You know, I mean, you, you, I mean, yeah. What's love got to do with it? Sure. You know, it's, you know we could talk all day about it, and the, and so the culture will give us all sorts of definitions and thoughts and questions about it, and and so we would never go there. But by the same token, how God has shown you that He loves you may or may not be the same way that He's revealed it to me. So the real question is, where do we get the information that we need to know about the authoritative nature of God's love? And that's his word. And it's loaded with it, by the way. I mean, his word doesn't hesitate to explain it, show us, and reveal it to us, which is why we come back to what we always say. So we've got to be good students of the word because, again, we want to know God better. Well, why do we know God better? Because God is love, and that will change everything about us. And so... The more we know him, the deeper we get with him, the more desire we have for him, the more intimacy we have with him, the more richness and depth we have to that relationship, the more we know how much God loves us because he reveals himself to us, but then the better off we are um, to share that with others. I mean, you know, I, when you um, want to become an authority on God's love, you've got to go to the Bible. And so the Bible... And the love of God is like a multifaceted diamond. Each 
facet reveals something else. And to begin to understand God, we have to go there and we have to discover what, it, what the Bible says about love. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to tackle the very simple subject <laughs> of how do we understand and know the bigness and the majesty of the love of God. With the idea that if this is true, and it is, by the way, God is love and God loves you. Okay? And that's what they're saying when he say he gets us. That's all that means. But that truth alone doesn't get you into heaven. Hear what I said. God loves you. That truth alone doesn't get you into heaven. He loves you, whether you accept him or not. He loves your lost neighbor just as much as he loves you. The fact that he loves you doesn't get you into the kingdom. What you do with that love and how you respond to that love is another example of how much he loves you because he gives you the freedom to choose to respond. So see, he gets you, but he wants to save you. And so understanding that God is love and how big that is is important. And that's what we're going to talk about. And we're, on Sunday morning, what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about then how that looks in your life. And how that funnels into what your legacy will be. Because your legacy is what you do that has an impact beyond you. An eternal impact. What it looks like. I'll give you an example. I'm not going to use this example Sunday, so this will work for you. When I was in seminary in Texas, this was, if you're a basketball fan, you know this was the NBA All-Star Weekend. When I was in seminary in Texas. Man, I, I, uh, I saved my money because I was a poor, struggling seminary student, and I know I wasn't a poor, struggling seminary My parents always made sure I had what I needed. So when my mom listens to this, I'm not saying, Mom, I was poor and destitute. <laughs> but a luxury was going to the NBA All-Star Weekend, which was in Dallas. And I was a basketball fan. And I, any extra money I had, I bought Dallas Maverick tickets. I went to a lot of basketball games when I was in Texas, to be really honest with you. And often it was the night before a test, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> But you